Okay, this is a great turnout. Thank you so much for being here. My name is Leslie Kershane. I am the CEO of the Tri-Cities Chamber of Commerce, and it is my pleasure to introduce the chair of our board of directors, Ryan Whittle, for some opening remarks. Thanks, Leslie. Good evening, everyone. Uh, I'd like to begin by respectfully acknowledging that this all candidates meeting is taking place on the traditional, ancestral, and unceded territory of the Quiquitlam First Nation. We thank the Quiquitlam who continue to live on these lands and care for them, along with the waters and all that is above and below. Welcome to the Tri-City Chamber of Commerce Port Quiquitlam All Candidates Meeting, presented by the Chamber's Group Insurance Plan. My name is Ryan Whittle. I'm the Chamber Board Chair and partner at Areti, a boutique accounting firm. As you may know, the Chamber is neutral in all elections. It's stated in our bylaws that we shall not endorse any particular candidate for public office. The Chamber greatly values its role as convener or as a convener of business, community and government to foster dialogue and focus on solutions to strengthen our communities. We are passionate about advancing local prosperity, and we look forward to working closely with the newly elected or re-elected mayors and councillors in the Tri-Cities following the election, as we have done with the current ones over the past four years. On behalf of the Chamber, Board of Directors and members, thank you to all the candidates participating tonight and to everyone joining us here in person and live on Zoom. On behalf of the Chamber's Board of Directors and membership, we congratulate Mayor Brad West on his acclamation. It is my pleasure to welcome Mayor West to the stage for some opening remarks. Well, good evening, everyone. It's Fantastic to see so many people out here. Thank you for taking an interest in the life of our city and democracy in Port Coquitlam. I want to use my time to uh, extend to everyone here my, my heartfelt thanks and, and gratitude for the confidence that this community has placed in me to serve as your mayor for another four years. It's something that I don't take for granted and I'm humbled by the support of our community. And I can assure you that I'll work as hard over the next four years as I've worked in the previous four years to continue to make Port Coquitlam uh, the best place in British Columbia. I, I want to say uh, thank you uh, to the city staff, to my colleagues on council who've been a huge part of accomplishing everything we've achieved over the last four years. It takes a team to achieve the type of things that we have, and we've had an excellent team in Port Coquitlam, not only in the past four years, but over a long period of time in our city. I want to thank my family. Uh, this can be a challenging role and a demanding role in many respects. I knew that when I signed up for it, uh, but my family has been a huge part of my time as mayor. Their support has been unwavering. Uh, their patience, uh, particularly that of my wife, has been really amazing. Uh, this is actually a date night for us. That's what, that's what happens. Uh, so to my wife, Blair, uh, my two sons, Liam and Owen, my mom, my stepdad, my sister, they're all here. Uh, thank you so much for your support in allowing me to be able to serve our community. We've lived in Port Coquitlam, I've lived in Port Coquitlam my entire life. Um, words cannot express how much I love this community and what a special place we have here. And it is a tremendous honor and privilege to serve an elected office in, in a community like this. And so I want to thank the chamber. I want to thank all the candidates, wish them very well. Uh, I'm looking forward to building upon all the success we've had over the last four years uh, to make Port Coquitlam an even better place to call home. So thank you very much and good luck to everyone. Thank you, Mayor West. We look forward to the next four years of your continued leadership. Now, I'd like to invite to the stage our moderator for tonight's event, 
Chamber Board Member and Executive Director of the Downtown POCO BIA, Jennifer McKinnon. Thanks, Ryan. Uh, good evening, everyone. I'd also like to acknowledge the Quiquitlam First Nations for the land that we are so blessed to live, work, and play on. The municipal election is October 15th, where Port Coquitlam residents will vote to elect six councillors on a four-year term. Tonight, we will be meeting most of the candidates for the councillor positions. We have one candidate who has sent their regrets this evening, Kevin Masura, due to a work conflict. Before we get started, I'd like to remind everyone that we'll be using Slido for tonight's discussion. You can launch the internet browser on your phone, go to slido.com, and key in your event code ACM-POCO. You can type in your questions or vote for questions that interest you. Pre-submitted questions have already been loaded for you to see. Please note we may edit for overlap, duplicity, and relevance, but generally the questions with the highest votes will be asked to the candidates. Please note not every candidate will answer each question we ask tonight, so you will not be able to direct your question to a particular candidate. We want to ensure that every candidate has a chance to answer the same number of questions in fairness to everyone. Okay, so let's go over the format for tonight's meeting. First, each candidate will have 90 seconds to introduce themselves and their platform. We will then call the candidates to the front of the stage in groups of two or three at a time. Each group of candidates will be asked a question and then they will each have 60 seconds to respond. Once all group members have answered, there will be an option for candidates to ask and answer follow-up questions from each other, limited to a 30 second rebuttal. We expect to have time for two rounds of questions tonight. After all the groups have completed the Q&A portion, candidates will be asked to give a 60 second closing statement. We will do our best to end the event at 9 p.m. or shortly thereafter. At this time, I would like to thank the team on stage here, Chamber Governance uh, Relations Committee member, Kevin Richter from Douglas College, as well as Mike Forrest, also former counselor of Port Coquitlam, uh, CEO, Leslie Kershane, and operations manager, Christina Brown for overseeing the Slido questions, Zoom, and timing candidates answers. And I've been to a couple and they are not going to put up with anything so behave yourselves all right candidates are you ready all right don you're up good evening we have the opportunity to position Port Coquitlam for the future. We need to imagine where we could be tomorrow, next year, in five and ten years and more. Port Coquitlam is a community people want to and choose to live in. Continued liv livability is important. A viable, versatile and vibrant Port Coquitlam is important to us all. I care about my community and I have chosen to live here for over 25 years. The essence of POCO is that sense of community. Balancing that with thoughtful development and growth is critical to our future livability as a community. Housing needs, transportation and traffic, the environment, and commercial and industrial interests all require a balanced approach, informed decision making, and forward thinking. I am Dawn Becker, and I hope to bring a new voice to Port Coquitlam City Council. I believe it's time for change, a fresh perspective on community issues, and a new voice on council. As the POCO Community Foundation Board Chair, an active community leader and volunteer, as well as a regular attendee at City Council meetings, I have a good understanding of our community, its needs, and where opportunities may be found. I am an advocate for our community. I question the status quo. I ask what we can do better now, tomorrow, and in the future. Good evening. My name is Cindy Cartner and I'm thrilled to be a candidate for City Council. I'm new to all of this. 
I've never been heavily involved in politics before. I decided to run for council because I am now at the point of my life where I want to contribute to our city in a more significant way. I want to be part of the decision-making process that makes Port Coquitlam an even better place to live. I've been fortunate to live in Port Coquitlam with my husband, Mike, and three daughters for the past 30 years. Over that time, we have enjoyed everything that Poco has to offer. We have played in Lions Park. We have rode our bikes and walked along the Poco Trail. We've competed and played sports at Gates Park and watched many dance recitals at the Terry Fox Theater. I have been actively involved with the schools that my daughters have attended. Port Coquitlam is a place with abundance of amenities. As it has grown, it's kept its small town charm. But there is still work to be done. We can still make it better. We can make transportation more accessible. We can be a model for environmental responsibility. And we can continue to create and make affordable housing options so people can stay here and raise their families. I am running to be a representative for everyone in our city. I will be a new, fresh voice on council. I will work extremely hard for a city and make this city the most livable city anywhere. I'm Cindy Cartner. I hope you enjoy your evening. Thank you. Good evening. My name is Ivanka Kuljak. It's a great pleasure to be here this evening. I've lived in Port Coquitlam with my family for almost eight years. I'm currently working as a real estate agent. I have a university degree in teaching. Uh, what motivated me to come here and run for this position? I'm very concerned that in this country, we lost our democracy. We lost democracy to speak freely. We don't have a freedom of the media. We don't have freedom to work where we want and also we lost the right for our bodily integrity. I would like to restore those values and so bring back our Canadian values to our community. I care deeply about my community and uh, I stand for good care and also health care safety. I'm going to advocate to bring more family doctors to our community. I will advocate to um, give back jobs to those people who lost their jobs in the last two years due to unlawful uh, mandates in order to improve service at our hospitals. I'm here also to give voice to the underrepresented people, to parents who are taking their children out of our public schools because of the policies that are being forced upon our children. And there's so much more that I can do, but there is no time to <laughs> say. Thank you for your attention. Uh, good evening and welcome everyone. My name is Steve Darling. Uh, I just want to acknowledge my my wife Jen and my son Hunter and Haley are in the audience today and both my kids are missing soccer practice so for them being here is a big deal so we want to thank them for being here. Um, you know I, I've been a, a champion for, for many, many years of the people when I was at Global Television. I, I worked hard to do stories about, about people in all walks of life. And I, I think that's what really drives me in this job is that I had the last four years as a city councillor. I was a champion for, for children. That's what drove me to fix Gates Park. I sat here four years ago and I said we needed to fix Gate Park. Now we've got $14 million of infrastructure coming into that facility. The legacy for children will be years and years to come. I've always been a champion of, of, of seniors as well. We have seniors housing coming into our city. We're taking care of seniors the way they should be cared for, the way they've earned the right to be cared for. And we've also been a champion of business as well. The downtown revitalization is only at the beginning and is only going to get better. I'm very proud of the work that I've done over the last four years and with my council colleagues, and I can't wait to look forward if I'm lucky enough to continue that work moving forward. We are on a, uh, a, an upward trend here in Port Coquitlam, and I'm just happy to be a big part of it. So thank you very much for being here again tonight. Hi, I'm Sarah Harbord, and the decisions made in municipal government affect our daily lives. Whether you like the roundabouts or not, I am lucky enough to not only raise my family here, but also work in the downtown core. 
My entire life is in Port Coquitlam. I feel there's so much potential for growth in POCO and believe my experiences would benefit decisions in regards to the rejuvenation of the downtown core. I want to continue the work I did with the POCO BIA, the Business Improvement Association. I want to attract more quality businesses so more residents have career opportunities closer to home. As a wife and a mother of three, I can relate to the challenges that the majority of the city faces on a daily basis. I want to be a conduit for your successes and hear about your struggles. I want to be your voice and continue to make POCO a place where families can thrive. I want to help Port Coquitlam be a leader in finding solutions to the complex issues. I endorse Mayor West's common sense approach to municipal government, and I know I could be an integral part of city improvements. I am very proud to be endorsed by the Labour Council. And with supports from Mayor West guidance and the door knocking with current councillors Glenn Pollock and Councillor Nancy McCurra, I know, Sarah Harbord, I am the ideal candidate moving forward. Thank you. Hi, I'm Derek Jeffrey. 27-year resident of uh, Port Coquitlam. I didn't expect to be on this stage tonight. Though I do feel compelled to run for I feel democracy is under attack, whether through censorship or the dog dogmatic decisions of our leaders. Because I feel strongly about this, I may digress slightly from time to time. Nevertheless, I pledge to address the topics asked more comprehensively on my substack. DerekJeffrey.substack.com. Do you feel the government lo no longer has your best interests interest at heart, but their own? Believe me, as I've canvassed across the city, I've found you are not alone. Over the course of this campaign, I've met the vaccine injured who have neither received proper support or informed consent. I've met citizens who've pro whose property was neither either damaged by a city hired contractor or damaged by the city itself with years of no recompense. I've met honest tax paying citizens who don't mind paying taxes, but expect, expect commensurate services. On October 15th, support Derek Jeffrey. A brief snapshot of my identity construct looks like this. I'm a mother, wife, business owner, published writer, immigrant. I'm one of those 52.7% recent immigrants in POCO who hold a higher university certificate. I'm a double master's degree holder. Despite this, I have had to continuously prove myself here in Canada. I am doing this today as well. My name is Mithila Karnik. Slightly easier to pronounce than Daenerys Targaryen. I am contesting for a city council seat to redirect a micro focus to community development in Port Coquitlam, a city whose greatest USP is its livability and thus its people. I want to facilitate diversity. A changing community deserves that its diverse people get an equal say at city council. Focusing on the downtown core to underscore diverse arts and cultural awareness deserves more than an EDI roundtable discussion. Unrelated, but Mayor Brad West rightly tweeted recently, when has appointing an expert panel to look at a long-standing issue ever resulted in anything besides wasting time? Let's move POCO in the direction of tech. The city's youth are ripe with potential to harness this energy that's over $5 trillion in growth globally. What's the first step to achieving all of this, you ask? Peer-to-peer -peer support. Draw on the experience of the experienced. That's my time, Mithila Karnik. Good evening, everyone. My name is Nancy Makura, and I'm seeking re-election after serving my first term. I am proud of the work our council has collectively achieved in the midst of a global pandemic, including some changes I initiated that will directly benefit our residents locally, and in a couple of cases, even Canadians nationally.
I'm a longtime Port Coquitlam resident, and during this past year and term, I've been very active and engaged city councillor, serving on numerous boards and committees as your city council designate, despite recovering from a broken leg. I am not afraid to be the solo vote opposed at council on board meetings with reason. My background is in the telecommunication industry, mainly in the TELUS Mobility Loyalty and Retention Department, where every call is challenging, giving me extensive people skills, finding solutions to difficult situations. I was the catalyst behind our super seniors being able to exercise for free. I made a difference with gender equity, and now our city has free period products in civic restrooms. Last year, I was honored to be the recipient of the United Way of the Lower Mainland Service Award for work done in our city as well as nationally. I have gained valuable experience this past term and want to do more for you. I hope you will vote for me so I will continue to make a difference. Check out my web website at nancyforportcoquetlam.ca for more detailed information. So who is this Eric Minty guy? I discovered Poco in 1997. I moved here after finishing my engineering degree. Um, and my career has evolved through quality management, project management, consulting, and now I'm bootstrapping a startup venture in the autism space. But home has always been here in Port Coquitlam, raising three kids <laughs> and uh, constantly volunteering everything from scouts to soccer. It's truly been a dream come true for me. Um, I have a broad range of sustainability and resilience-based initiatives that I plan to work hard on. Things like safe cycling network, low carbon materials, procurement car sharing, mixed use development, complete communities, this is a bunch of stuff. Um, but after a lot of doorstep conversations, I've learned that we have a public trust issue. And public trust requires an uncomfortable level of transparency. There have been too many decisions made behind closed doors without meaningful public engagement. We need to start treating citizens as participants in the conversation instead of obstacles to be overcome. But nothing else we talk about tonight will matter if half the city is underwater. We're in the highest flood risk impact category. Our dike quality is rated as low and the urgency is increasing every year. Incorporating natural assets into our asset management system is one thing that could help buffer some of these costs. I look forward to hearing some of your questions tonight, and hopefully that's the start and not the end of the conversation. Thank you. Hi, my name is Darren Nielsen. I, thank you. Uh, I too was made in Poco. Uh, in Birchland Manor, at my grandfather's house, and we moved away and grew up in Richmond. And then when I got married, I knew the place to come back was home. So I raised my two older children, they're 35 and 32, uh, here in Port Coquitlam. And now with my wife, we are raising three other young children, uh, seven, nine, and 10. And my mother, who's 82 years old, is living with us. So I think I, <clears throat> and my wife's much younger than I am, so I have a pretty good spectrum of the ages in understanding the needs of the residents of Port Coquitlam. And my activities and involvement in the community, I feel I've been pretty well uh, throughout the sports from executive member on hockey and uh, in baseball. Uh, but in the past campaigns that I've run, it's my interest in the community to make it better. And I've been an advocate for safety, especially in the last campaign. I was the only candidate who identified from knocking on the doors that the number one issue was community safety. Now you see the flashing beacons that are, I push for are being installed and I congratulate council. I don't take ownership of it. <clears throat> I give congratulations to council for listening and doing what's right. So uh, thank you to the mayor and council. And they're putting speed humps in the school zones or speed hump. We need more than just one, but we could hopefully work on that. Dingle, dingle. That was my dingle, right? Okay. All right. There's more if you want to read after the meeting. Okay. There you go, Daryl. Well, good evening, everybody. Thanks for coming out. Thanks for all the people participating on Zoom. Uh, thanks for my wife coming out tonight. And, uh, now all my uh, friends and supporters that are here tonight. 
Uh, I've had the wonderful pleasure of uh, being on council and serving this great community for the last 23 years. I remember when I first got elected, I thought there was a bunch of old farts on council and now I'm one of them. And uh, I've lived here for 52 years, uh, have certainly seen those changes that a lot of people talk about. Um, I've been involved with a lot of changes. Um, like anyone it's, uh, that makes a difference, it still is a team that ultimately decides. Uh, I have certainly myself have got the ball rolling, for instance, on the Cosprian overpass. When I ran in 1996, that was the number one issue, got elected in 99 and plowed away at it and we managed to get that overpass built. Uh, it, there's lots of the matching grants uh, policy, for instance, it's a real community building um, policy uh, to help the community, I, I initiated that. But at the end of the day, your job is to select a group of people that can work together as a team to wade through all of the garbage and go what is really important for our community make sure that our taxes are kept low we're the third lowest tax community in all of metro vancouver uh, and get projects finished we managed to get the um, community center done on time and on budget thanks a lot i'm daryl penner Nicely said. My name is Paige Petru. I'm 33. I've lived in the Tri-Cities my entire life, and I'm proud to call Port Coquitlam home. Some of you may know me for my work planning community events. As the owner of a POCO-based events and marketing company, I've had the privilege of working with many local organizations over the past 10 years. I've served on countless committees, and I've been fortunate enough to build collaborative relationships with many local businesses, residents, and community stakeholders. In 2018, I was selected by Mayor Brad West to serve as an advisor on the Mayor's Citizen Advisory Roundtable. This role has given me valuable experience over the past four years, consulting with city staff and others on to give feedback on uh, projects and initiatives that have helped move the needle forward in the right direction. While I'm very driven in my career, my most important job is being mother to my two young boys. Like so many others in our community, I balance working full time with family responsibilities and raising my children. My husband and I face the daily challenges of affordability, childcare, running our businesses and more. I understand what matters to families like ours. I'm running for council to bring this perspective and a renewed energy to the team. Diversity in age and demographic is imperative among council members to represent all the many different residents in Poco. Millennial women like me have a powerful voice. Our stake in this Good evening, my name is Glenn Pollock and uh, I was first elected to council in 2008 along with Mayor Brad West and I'm proud to have served the community for 14 years. Um, I'm also proud of this council and what we accomplished uh, in the last term. A few of those accomplishments are completing the uh, new community center on time and on budget despite a global pandemic, investing in city infrastructure such as roads, sewers, lighting, improvement to traffic and pedestrian safety. We're taking action on climate change. We're revitalizing our downtown core. We've been supporting sports and recreation in this city with not only the rec center, but also upgrades to Gates Park. Mayor West understood my passion for addressing the housing issue and so awarded me the housing portfolio on council. During this term, we've added just under 500 units of truly affordable housing. I'm proud to say that I'm directly responsible for about 140 of those units. A project that I started about six years ago has come to fruition at, at uh, Flinton Prairie and should be ready for, uh, for occupation any day now. Uh, I also established the People's Pantry Food Sharing Group along with two friends of mine, Pam Eberl and uh, Christy DeYoung. The pantry collects food from local retailers that would otherwise end up in the landfill and redis redistributes it to needy families. I hope to be re-elected re in order to continue this important work and support Mayor West to the best of my abilities. I think this city is fortunate to have a man of his character at the helm, and I'd like to continue to work with him and the rest of council. Thank you very much. Hi, I'm Justin Alexander Smith. I lived in Port Coquitlam for 21 years. I went to school here, I grew up here, and I worked here. Growing up, I biked the Poco Trail in the summer with my dad, appreciated the sunset at Skyline Park, and played guitar down at Lee Square. I loved the opportunity that Port Coquitlam provided. I saw it firsthand with my mom running a small business from home. My dad said to stay legally. 
Our city even inspired my love of political engagement with electing a young mayor for the first time, a young counselor, future mayor in 2008. I want to stay in Port Coquitlam, raise a family, and give the next generation the same amazing opportunity I had. Unfortunately, I couldn't. After finishing my bachelor's degree, I had to leave. Despite having a full-time job in um, the field of my study, I cannot find a place to live within my budget. If I don't live in Port Coquitlam, why am I running to be on city council? I'm running because I want to be here, I want to represent the urgency of the affordability crisis on this council. I'm running to represent a generation of residents coming into adulthood and finding out that we may not, we may not be able to make the choice to live in the city. That choice is already made for us. I'm here to apply every skill and value that this city taught me to help it become an affordable, sustainable, and engaged place. Tonight, I hope to talk about my plans to make engaging with council easier for you, my hopes to deliver results as part of Mayor West's Common Sense Council, and earn one of your six votes this October 15th. Thank you. Thanks, Joe. Uh, good evening. I'm sitting in the meat locker seat, frozen to death here, but my name is Dean Washington. I'm seeking a fourth term, I can't believe I'm saying that, uh, on City Council. Over the past 11 years on council, I am proud of the many accomplishments we have made, been able to deliver. I'm a true believer in getting the basics right, and I believe we have proved that over the last four years. From having the lowest average taxes of any <laughs> full-size city in Metro Vancouver, to <laughs> record road, water, and sewer uh, capital projects delivered in your neighborhoods, uh, and to deliver our cherished Pork Equipment Community Center on time, on budget, in a global pandemic. I don't know if you've ever heard that before, but I may have a few times. We also have successfully uh, launched our large uh, item pickup program, weekly green waste pickup. We expanded that to weekly, and many environmental in incentives like the sorry revisions to the city's tree policy. We have made our parks a better place to visit with upgrades to playgrounds and the ability to have an adult drink while spending time with our families. We approved, as mentioned, almost 500 uh, much needed affordable house units that will be coming online in the next few years. And Hi everyone, before I introduce myself, I would like to ask an indulgence of the fellow candidates and all of you. I have a profound to severe hearing loss, which requires me to heavily rely on lip reading. So bear with me if I make mistakes or repeat your answers. Um, so my name is Jamie Watson. My family and I moved here almost 40 years ago. Some of you know me as many different things, as a mother of Ben, Mac, Charlie, and Sienna as a longtime Costco employee, as a Riverwood resident who raised tech over reconciliation for the women who died on the Picton property, as a former diversity roundtable member, and as a passionate advocate for gardens. I raised my kids here, I bought my first home here, I work here, and I play here. Poco is where I call home. My determination to find a role in the city has never wavered. I truly believe that, si that cities can change the world and that POCO can lead by example with accessibility, sustainability, and innovation. A vote for me is a vote for our future. Vote for Jamie Watson. Thank you. Good evening. My name is Jenny. And I'm also running on a platform that calls for restoring Canadian values in local politics. So here I want to share something that just came out of the 2021 World Democracy Index report put together by the Economist Intelligence Unit. The report showed that Canada dropped seven spots from number five to now number 12 in its score and making it the lowest out of all the Western developed countries. And the direct quote from this report says, new survey data show a worrying trend of disaffection among Canada citizens with traditional democratic institutions and increased level of support for non-democratic alternatives, such as rule by experts or the military. 
Canada citizens feel that they have little control over their lives, a sentiment that has been compounded by the pandemic related restrictions on individual freedoms. So this sentiment is shared by myself and many that I have spoken to in my communities since the COVID mandates came into place last year. I have a platform that focuses on government transparency and accountability, as well as protecting the rights of individual freedoms. Our family moved here from China and I graduated from UBC with a Bachelor of Arts, um, majoring in Asian Studies, and I have worked. Okay, thank you, candidates. Uh, for those of you who didn't quite get it, the Port Coquitlam Community Center was finished on time and on budget during a global pandemic. <clears throat> and it's beautiful. Okay, we will now enter the Q&A portion of the evening. As a reminder, each candidate will have 60 seconds to respond to the question. Uh, we will call up Don, Cindy, and Ivanka to start, please. So we, before we move to Slido questions, we're gonna start with a question from the chamber. Okay, if elected, what will you do to ensure Port Coquitlam attracts and retains strong business in a variety of sectors? Don, we'll start with you. The city currently has a very active program for attracting businesses and industries. I think it's working well. Uh, as with everything, there's always room for improvement. It would be consultation with chambers of commerce. It would be convert. Uh, collaboration and conversations with Board of Trades to see seek out those industries that do want to move to a community like POCO where people are engaged. Thank you. Cindy? Port Coquitlam. Can you hear me? Yeah, there you go. Port Coquitlam has a, a large variety of different businesses. I think the businesses coming in to Port Coquitlam, we can accommodate by giving them beautiful place to set to set up i think that we can if it's industry that's coming in we have a, a nice industrial area that they can work work in there um, i think we just have to continue talking looking looking for businesses that we want to come into our community and ask them and that's it thank you i definitely would like to give my support to small local businesses not everybody needs to work for big corporations, for Walmart and so on. Small local businesses and the owners of those businesses are going to be more creative and will be able to contribute to our community. What to do to support them? We certainly can have more events. We can uh, attract more tourists to um, our city. We can support them by buying local. We can support them by paying cash because that benefits them, they pay less uh, in certain transaction fees. So uh, definitely I also would support construction that would allow for mixed use upstairs for residential and then also uh, the, uh, the basement or ground level to be for businesses, all types of businesses. I mentioned also in my introduction, I would love to, to invite more family doctors to come to our community. Uh, Don, rebuttal. With uh, small local businesses, they they are they are the types of businesses that give us that sense of community. The larger ones, such as Walmart and Lord Co's, they're very attractive. They give us a lot of jobs. They give us a very large industrial tax base, which helps to keep residents' taxes lower. We need all sizes of business from family doctors to Walmart to Lordco to to take five coffee shop in downtown Poco. Thanks Don. Cindy. I agree with Don. I think that the big businesses are attractive because when we live in a city like Port Coquitlam we want everything accessible. It also they also employ a lot of people. The small businesses give people a chance to 
be entrepreneurs, to set, to challenge themselves, to bring new business into our community. I also would like to um, have another hotel. <laughs> So I don't think that we have enough hotels uh, in our community. Um, and um, definitely to have more events, organize more events uh, in Port Coquitlam, attract more tourists. Wonderful. Thank you. OK, thank you, candidates. Next, we have Steve Darling, Sarah Harbord, and Derek Jeffrey. Okay, the question is, what are your plans for improving active transportation infrastructure in Port Coquitlam? Um, I think we've, uh, we've done a really good job over the last four years of addressing that situation, um, trying to find ways of, of making sure that we make streets safe, but also accessible for people to bike, to ride, to walk, uh, to scooter, that we're seeing a lot of those in the city as well. We're also blessed with having such an amazing trail system around as well. We're a natural fit for active transportation, but more needs to be done. More streets need to be done. More multi-use paths needs to come. And that's a focus for us in the next four years as well, is to make sure that we continue to build on what we've done already and make sure we offer those opportunities for people to use either their bicycle, their walking, or their scooters as well. I agree with what Mr. Darling is saying. I'm happy to see all of the bike lanes going in and for all of the scooters, the electric bikes, for all the kids that are out there. And we have to continue making their streets safe for all types of transportation. I agree. Uh, the uh, scooters that I see in the streets seem quite dangerous to me. Maybe we do need a bylaw for that. but. Uh, I'm coming out of the transportation sector, and I lost my job like a year ago. I was working for an airline, and uh, I refused to take the, uh, I was uh, let go because I refused to take the uh, vaccination. So it affected me quite severely, and that is why I think transportation is important. But it's strange that suddenly, after I don't know, much pushback and the polls, people are allowed to travel again. But that is my take on transportation. Thank you, Derek. Anything to add? On that specifically? Or? Mm, maybe in general. <laughs> well, I'll just say, first off, um, I feel for you in, in losing your job. I, I you know, I. I've gone through it as well, and a lot of people, other people have, so I, I feel for you. Um, that, was a, that was a playbook that was happening minute by minute, so to speak, and something we've never seen around the world before. But, you know, in, in transportation-wise within our city, the great thing about our city is that we have an opportunity here to, to really move forward. And the one thing you, you talk about what happened during the pandemic, Port Coquitlam was a leader in the pandemic. We led the way. And Thanks, Steve. Sorry, it's only 30 seconds. <laughs> Sarah, would you like to finish what Steve had to say? <laughs> um, yes, I also give my condolences for your job that was lost. And we have to create more transportation for all types of trans for all types of vehicles or bikes or the scooters or those unicycle skateboard things that I see everywhere that look very scary. <laughs> Um, so I agree, we have to keep continuing forward with the transportation issues in Port Coquitlam. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you. I'm not sure if uh, Port Coquitlam was a leader in the pandemic. It seems like some city workers need to accept the mandate and the others don't. So that seems strange. But uh, transportation wise, I've, I've noticed a lot of complaints about speeding in the streets. And my, my idea would be that we'd be have uh, speed humps 
over uh, some of the roads, especially Coast Meridian. It seems very excessive. Excellent. Thanks, all. Okay, the next group will have Matilla, Nancy, and Eric, please. Okay. Okay, the question is... What actions would you take as an elected city councillor to engage the citizens of POCO in the decision policy making process? Well, that's a really easy question for me to answer. I think we need to make our community more accessible um, to city council. And the first way to go about doing that is breaking down the barrier that we have in terms of representation. The second you see a familiar face or somebody that you can relate to, maybe on a facial level or a language level or an access level, communication then becomes a lot easier. So if we were to connect with the changing demographic that we see in Port Coquitlam now, I think diversity and acknowledging representation on city council is the first step forward. Thank you, Nancy. In regards to decision-making processes, uh, I do believe that the citizens should always be involved in some way when there's a, um, a decision that affects the community, such as, for instance, we've got an affordability issue now with uh, people finding homes. So personally, I think that the ratio of 10% is too low that we have in our city. So we need to engage the people to see, should it really be 15, 20% that we try to find affordable housing uh, for, for many of our people, as well as how, how about engaging our homelessness, our homeless community. Uh, they desperately need uh, shelters. So I'm so happy that we've got $877,000 that com that's coming into the city as well as to the city of Port Moody, where we can uh, collaborate together to find ways that we can reach to the people to make policies so that they can have a roof. Thanks, Nancy. Thank Eric? I, I was initially a little sad that I didn't get the active transportation question because I'm a cyclist. <laughs> but um, I, I'm really worried because my neighborhood's about to be overturned by a massive construction project at Gates Park that nobody asked us about. We found out it was super secret and it was totally behind closed doors. And, and so we still don't know anything about that project. So it might be a really good project, I don't know, but we don't have the details and it's hard to find out. Um, and there's been no active, there's been no public engagement on it whatsoever. So that, that's a punch in the gut and, and, and we feel that. Um, but we used to have committees and they were, we, we lost the committees and, and gosh, maybe it was replaced by something better. There's no transparency and accountability in the roundtables that we have right now. Uh, and I think we could do better. Um, the, uh, if you have smaller community, like it, it, within the neighborhood, you know, you have these, um, not town halls, but where you have, uh, where you get together and just, um, uh, you just interact with the public and uh, open houses, right? Thanks, Eric. Matilla? I don't actually have anything to ask them, okay. if that's okay. Yes, of yeah. course. Because yeah. I agree with them, so, yeah. So, yeah, um, in regards to public input, um, we can do better by perhaps uh, putting things out more frequently on social media. Our agendas are out there, but these things come forward for uh, discussion and maybe we can preempt them more by, okay, we're gonna do a citizens workshop and a town hall now that COVID is opened up. We can engage the people more. We just have to, um, uh, you know, uh, figure out ways we can do it. Thank you. Thanks, Nancy. Eric? 
Yeah, just to elaborate on the like what I was talking about before, and, and a lot of people like this idea of having those those you know you mentioned the workshops and things like that. There's interactive. It's not just you know it's not just someone from the city telling you what's going on. Where you have an opportunity to have your say, have your feedback, and then maybe they come back six months later, or, and 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 you have that uh, you know you have that ability to say, well, this is what we did, and this is what you said, and this is what we've done, and that and that kind of thing. It would really help restore public trust because there's a lot of really good things going on in the city, but people don't know about it, and then there's surprises and. They well, where did that decision come from? Wonderful. Thank you, candidates. Okay, if I can have Darren Nielsen and Daryl Penner, please. Keep you on your toes. Okay, your question is, revitalization efforts have changed Poco's downtown in terms of land use and walkability, but we still use our car to access downtown due to challenges like unreliable bike lanes that fail to connect downtown to surrounding residential areas. How would you increase accessibility to downtown Poco? Darren? Accessibility for downtown. Well, I live on the north side, and I won't be taking my scooter that would connect, can connect to the bike lane. So for somebody coming from the north side, chances are we will probably drive into the downtown area, which is a different issue is the parking downtown, unless we're using the rec center, which is ample for parking there. And with the Donald Pathway, uh, connecting uh, to the Lee Square. I think that's uh, really good for the parking situation. But when we're looking at, I do agree with the bike lanes because I have heard that uh, from others. They, they go out for riding their bike and then the sidewalks disappear. There's nothing there. So I haven't taken a look at downtown uh, for the apartments. But when you're looking at, if I'm coming, in, for example, to Terry Fox, when we came across the CMO, I'm waiting for the sidewalk on Kingsway to get built. That will make a huge difference in tying into the, the rec center. Excellent. Thanks, Thanks Darren. Darren. You're welcome. That was Darryl. a perfect segue into that. Uh, it's my other brother, Darrell. Yeah. So uh, we are uh, currently in the midst of uh, building uh, the uh, multi-use path along Kingsway, which will run the entire length of uh, Kingsway through to the downtown from, uh, from the Coast Bay and Overpass or excuse me, from, uh, from uh, Kingsway. But it, it's an interesting question because as far as accessibility and driving your car, nobody gets up and tells me in the morning, you have to drive your car to the downtown. There, there's other ways of getting downtown right now. Are they absolutely perfect? Well, no, they're not. But we are, you know, us as a, as a society are getting better at, at uh, transit, using public transit. Um, all of the linkages, and I don't disagree at all, that they are not there. And I wish we could build something and have a whole plan and, fix, and have it done instantly. It just doesn't work that way. It's incremental. We get funding. We just got some funding for the multi-use path at Kingsway. We get funding for other bike paths. Takes time. Thanks, Darren. Yeah. Darren, any further comments? Nope. Nothing to add. Darren, do you want another 30 seconds? I could just talk for 30 seconds. <laughs> it's, it, it, it's, uh, it, 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 it's, it's, it's difficult to get projects done, done all in one shot. Budgets are always something that we have to wrestle with. Um, that is why we are in the position we are and we're in an excellent financial position because of that. Um, so there's not one magic answer for it. Uh, as much as it is frustrating to see projects not completely finished. Um, you know that you know what the goal is at the end, and that's that's what you always have to keep your eye on. Thank Excellent. You. Thanks, gentlemen. Okay, our next group is Paige Petru, Glenn Pollock, and Justin Alexander Smith. Should I just kneel like this? <laughs> Do you want to switch? <laughs> in your opinion, what is the number one concern of the people living in Poco? 
Um, I'd say based on most of my conversations that I've had in the community, affordability is the one that comes up most often at all stages of life, whether you're um, starting out. I think Justin has already alluded to that challenge, trying to get into the housing market, whether you're someone like me, a young family trying to afford to live in this community, or even a senior living on a pension, um, limited income, and trying to make ends meet in that stage of life. So I think affordability, affordability is definitely an issue, not only in our city, but across the province so it's definitely one that we need to be diligent and taking action steps to address um i'll leave it at that thank you Glenn? i i agree with Paige. uh the affordability is a, is a big issue uh it's probably the number one issue for people all around affordability we're doing the best that we can at the local level to keep uh, property taxes down because uh, you know taxes are high all over, and and we need to do what we can to keep them down here. We've done that, as Councillor Washington mentioned, we're one of the lowest in the region. Um, but there's other, there's all kinds of things, homelessness and housing, you know, are related, and uh, poverty, uh, criminalizing poverty, all those things are all in, uh, related. And community safety, I kind of going all over the map here, but they're all related to to affordability. Thank you. Thanks, For sure. Man. I got to agree with Glenn here. I think that affordability and all these issues are connected. The way I think about affordability is going through and are we going to be able to continue living the lives we want to live the way we want to? I think, honestly, our current council has done a great job keeping our taxes low. One of the issues is, is the provincial government does not prov provide enough funding to municipal governments. Out of every tax dollar you pay, only 12 cents goes towards municipalities, despite municipalities fronting so many services services fronting infrastructure. What we need is an advocate on council who's going to be able to work with the provincial government to increase that share and also open up some other revenue opportunities so we can go through and make sure that your tax dollars are being spent wisely, keeping property taxes low, creating new rental buildings, co-op housing, rent to own, and home ownership opportunities. Thanks, Justin. Paige? I didn't know that fact you said about how much provincial government funding goes to municipalities so i gotta fact check that but if it's true i agree that there's a lot of advocacy that can be done at the municipal level to hold our provincial government accountable um, and to have them address the specific issues that are under their jurisdiction so i 100 percent agree on that one i'll also touch on i don't know how much time i have but mental health because i think this is a probably in my opinion the second most um biggest issue that I hear is this mental health crisis. That's how much time you had. <laughs> Glenn? So just quickly related to affordability, uh, you know, we, we've, we need to, we've had a, recently had a housing needs assessment in the city and it shows we need to increase housing across the whole spectrum. But uh, another th thing I think we can do as part of that is bring in affordable home ownership where uh, we take city property and it's much like the, the building I did the, at Flint Prairie, the Atira building. We rented the property uh, from Metro Vancouver for a dollar a year for 60 years. And we need to take the opportunities like that to, to get young people into the housing market. And I'll just add on to that right there, looking at using city um, uh, owned land, uh, the type of loans that a city can get is significantly better and uh, lower interest than what we're looking at private companies. So if at council we're looking for new affordable housing opportunities, we develop that as uh, either public housing or negotiated through the public, we're likely going to get a better deal and not pot pass those costs down onto you in the long term. Excellent. Thanks all. Okay, next group, Dean Washington, Jamie Watson, and Jenny Zhou. Okay, what concrete action can be taken at a municipal level to mitigate or adapt to climate change? Well, great, my biggest weakness, <laughs> I'm the budget guy. <laughs> um, I don't, I always think that, uh, I think the city's doing, uh, a lot of things. It's a lot of the climate, um, policy is brought down by the provincial government and Metro Vancouver. Uh, we are doing, launching our first climate action, um, study, uh, in the next term, if, if I'm there. Um, and, but I, I think what we're doing also our visioning in the downtown area uh, with uh, uh, multifamily housing density, which a lot of people don't like, but uh, nothing um, 
nothing is uh, worse on the environment than a single family home. So uh, I believe that density is the key. I think that we'll see what happens with our climate action study and uh, putting pressure on the provincial and federal governments to do more. Thank you. Christine. Um, that's a question I'm very excited to have. Um, green tech, to me, is something that is a way in with climate change. The very definition of green tech is technology to reverse the human effects on the environment. And actually, Surrey right now has something that I'm very excited about. It's biofuel, and it's a waste management facility and that um, actually creates fuel for their trucks. 8,500 vehicles a year are fueled by these biofuel in Surrey. So there's so much out there and we need to look to other cities and what they've been successful in and uh, POCO has a, a huge potential to move forward in this future. Okay, um, so according to a recent study that I read, Canada accounts for 1.4% of the global carbon emissions. So even Deputy Prime Minister Christopher Freeland has said that, you know, no matter what we do, we're not going to move the dial. However, it is not saying that climate change is not an issue. It's not to say that we should not be protecting the environment. But I'm saying that, um, yes, we can uh, move towards a more green lifestyle. We can support local businesses, but the biggest polluters of the world are China, India, the, these are the developing countries. And we, if we in Canada are importing all these goods from these parts of the country, then we are attributing to climate change as well. So we must be conscious and aware of our purchases, our lifestyle. Thanks, Jane. Okay, um, the one thing that I've learned in my time on council is that people are quick to say you should do more on the environment. But I think that every decision that we make, staff do an incredible job of bringing the most environmentally friendly solution to what we're trying to do. I mean, I know that the needle's not moving quick enough for a lot of people, but it's certainly, it's something that I wasn't aware, I just assumed that we just did whatever, but. The, the staff spends a lot of time researching. Thanks, Dean. Um, I believe there's a lot of climate anxiety, and I think we talk about what we can't do when there's so much out there that we can do. And we need to change that dialogue, and we need to be open to the innovations and the technology that are out there for us to use as a city. Um. Actually, I'd like to go back to a previous question. Is, is that okay, to the previous question, or it has to be this one? About the number one issue, because um, ever since um, we started campaigning, we're doing a lot of door knocking, talking to a lot of people, and we hear various concerns you know, regarding crime, increasing crime, uh, traffic, roads, and uh, mental health, of course, these are very important issues that we can address, that we must address as a community. Uh, but when I start to... Thanks all. Okay, so that concludes our first round. <clears throat> now for round two, we will call you up in different groups. Uh, so we're going to start with Steve, Matilla, and Justin Alexander-Smith, please. Steve Darling. Okay, in your opinion, who are the underrepresented in our community and how will you help them? To me, there are three layers to this um, in terms of underrepresented communities. The first to me are um, senior citizens. In the time that we are living currently, there are a lot of um, issues that they are facing, especially to do with affordability, standard of living, food shortage. Um, the second marginalized group that I would really 
like to work hard to represent um, are the diverse population of Port Coquitlam. We are a city that's being changed by immigrants and we need to recognize the economic power that immigrants bring to the city of Port Coquitlam, especially if we are talking 40 years down the line. And the third group that I really want to work hard towards um, rehabilitating are the homeless. To me, I think that is a Tri-Cities initiative. I know we've been working with Port Moody in the past, and I think we need to strengthen ties with Coquitlam, with Port Coquitlam, to effect a process and safe space for these. So yes, those are my top three. Thank you. Um, I would agree with you. I think, uh, I think the homeless is under, underrepresented. That's why, uh, myself along with a couple other council members sit on the Tri-Cities Homeless Task Force. There are some amazing programs that are beginning, um, and that have been in place for a while now that are trying to, to really represent the people who are unrepresented. But the other one I think is youth. And I, I think it sits in well with the next question as well, because we need to engage our youth a lot more. There's some really great ideas from young people and you just sit and talk to them and understand they get it 100% and engaging them more, getting them more involved in the process, getting them more involved in their cities, I think would serve everybody a lot better going forward. Thanks, Steve. I'm doing a lot of agreeing today. I'm absolutely in agreement when we're talking about uh, youth. Coming from people in my age group, a little bit younger, a lot of youth feel very disconnected and out of the loop. One of the things I think we need to do is take the information that the city's already posting and find a way to repackage it in a way that's actually going to get through to young people. They go through onto different platforms than we're you know, typically used to. Facebook's not as popular. If we can find ways to engage young people on Instagram through TikTok, um, or like if we go directly through to the high schools, uh, Riverside, uh, Terry Fox, I think young people have a lot of amazing ideas. That will be one of my top priorities, is finding a way to bring them and start to reduce some of that political dissatisfaction the young people feel on all levels of government. I hope you weren't gonna bring up TikTok because <laughs> my, uh, just before we came here, my daughter has a new phone and I put all her information on it and lost every one of her TikTok videos she recorded. Oh. So, so right now, TikTok is not one of my favorite things, but very important, You're obviously. probably not her favorite thing That's right, right. I'm not her favorite <laughs> thing as well. So uh, thankfully she's too young to vote. Um, I might have just lost one. No, um, I, I think it's I, I think it's really important. Um, I'm actually speaking, going to be at Riverside speaking to students. Thanks, Steve. I, that was like the best rebuttal, though, regardless of the bell. <laughs> I think my daughter left too. I think she's gone. I am in complete agreement with Steve and Justin. I want to draw attention to the fact that when it comes to even engaging youth and a lot of our population. It also means engaging their parents. And if most of the population operates from a sense of disenfranchisement, I got that right, um, from a term of, say, language or accessibility or comfort, if you want to engage youth, the most time that they spend with, apart from other people, are their parents. So, thanks, Patella. One second. <laughs> Generally, um, as Steve was saying, we're going down to engage the youth at Riverside Secondary on Wednesday. Uh, that's something I'm really excited to do just because I graduated there six years ago. And I think engaging with the youth, we can start to get a better idea of what are the things that really concern them so we can start to prepare. Because we wanna make sure that we can prepare for the next generation of families. That's something I hope I can raise my family here. And I know that uh, the next generation is also thinking about that. So if we get their ideas, get them engaged young, then we'll get more young people running for council um, and prepare. Thank you, thanks all. Okay, next group is Cindy, Daryl, and Jamie. Coming up, Cindy, Daryl, and Jamie.
Apparently, voter turnout during the 2018 municipal election was around 28%, 7.5% lower than the provincial average. If elected, what would you do to increase public engagement and interest in the next election? Well, <clears throat> I think this election uh, is, is a little difficult because we don't have to vote for a mayor, so that even brings things down lower. But I think Port Coquitlam does a really good job. It puts a lot on social media, where to vote. We've got advanced voting, mail-in voting. Some people have asked me about um, online, just clicking and voting. I don't know all the ins and outs on that, but I just think continual social media is to me the best way to get the, the word out there. Um, I think the key to voter turnout is our youth and um, keeping the education in school with how civics work. I also think that we as local politicians and uh, be active in engaging with our youth, keeping them interested. And the other thing is too, is a big key is post-secondary. If the children, the youth are educated, then they have the education to civic. My older children are completely engaged with civics because I've raised them that way. So the key is our youth to get them engaged in civics. Thanks. Well, municipal polit or elections have been notoriously low ter voter turnout, have, have been for decades and decades. If you just look at the stats, that's the way they usually turn out. Uh, I can definitively tell you that if you would come up with a tax increase of 12%, you would get a lot of people showing up at the, t at the uh, <laughs> election. But uh that is not what you want to do um so it's just that continuous uh engagement i think cindy really nailed it on the head we we've done it uh with the social uh, media uh we try to engage every group that we can uh when we have projects we engage other groups uh that are definitely um stakeholders uh it has been and it will be an ongoing uh struggle to uh, to achieve those goals. There are tons of courses that you can pay a lot of money to go to, to learn how to do it, but at the end of the day, they still don't produce anything. Thanks, Daryl. Anything else? No, you know. you have anything else? Pardon me? Do you have a rebuttal? No, I think they both covered it pretty well. <laughs> do you want 30 more seconds, Daryl? Well, I got 30 seconds to keep talking again. <laughs> No, I, I, that's it. I, it, it's, it has always been a, a real struggle, so, uh, but you guys are not part of that problem. So thank you very much for coming. Should, could I quickly yeah. say something? Yeah. I, I feel that with the pandemic, there has been a um, political um, exhaustion, and people are exhausted, so they tune out, and they aren't seeing action they're 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 done and so we need to move forward in small steps in having projects that actually follow through and engagement with the with the city excellent thanks all okay next up we have don nancy and jenny How can we make sure that money from people associated with developers doesn't have undue influence on our city government? Nancy? Well, to begin with, it's part of our, our community um, oath when we take our oath of office, is that uh, we are not uh, able to like be persuaded by somebody from the outside that's a developer to vote certain ways. So the integrity comes from within, and uh, I'm, I, I mean, so far I, ha I haven't seen anything happen in the city that might lead to something like this. 
I'm actually thinking we're working very well with our developers uh, collaboratively. We've, we've started um, our affordable housing that we've worked on very hard with 500 non-market affordable housing units that are in different stages of development. Uh, so we just need to keep working more uh, to keep the percentages moving up for our affordable housing and uh, the developers are for it because everybody wants to, to see people have a home. Thank you. Thanks, Nancy. It's City Council's role to listen to the community, and it's City Council's role to make decisions collaboratively with no one single person having the power to, to cast aside the votes. Uh, there is no veto on City Council, so it is very much uh, decision making that's made collaboratively. I agree with Nancy, uh, the, the oath that councillors take, uh, I would hope, would preclude anybody from uh, considering th their actions. But, uh, but City Council is a team effort, it's a collaborative effort. Decision making is held collectively and not by a single individual. Um, I would think that uh, here's where government transparency is very important. So if there's a development project going on, we should be able to know uh, what kind of money transactions has happened between city councillor and certain developers that are involved in the development to see if there has been any campaign donations. And that also should be disclosed to the public. And if the public take issue with that, then maybe we can look at having that particular councillor step aside and not be involved or um, answer more questions to the public. Okay, thanks Jenny. Nancy? Um, I just continually think that uh, the developers that we've so far been working with, um, I, I feel that they have our citizens' best interests at heart uh, and we work very hard with them through our staff and we take the lead from, from our staff often producing formulas and, and whatever it takes to make our city a better place. And the undue influence is that I can't even see it. Um, the first time. Thanks, Nancy. As a regular city council observer and attendee at meetings, I have seen when city councillors have recused themselves from discussions around areas of development or decisions that were made around developments so that integrity does exist and is practiced and uh, is, is apparent at. Wait. Um, I just want to go back to the previous question regarding the underrepresented. A large group of people who are underrepresented are the healthcare workers that have been fired from their jobs, as well as a lot of the uh, workers that was fired that were for the province. So, and people who did not agree with the mandates, whether small businesses or people in our community that are afraid to speak up. So this is one group, and this is the same group of people that have chose to disengage from, um, from public elections. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you. I, I just wanted to thank uh, Dawn for for reminding me about recusing yourself. There was actually discussions where Telus was a developer and myself as a Telus employee. Sorry, I removed. You only have one rebuttal. My... Thank you. <laughs> they cut you off. <laughs> okay. Next up, Dean and Ivanka. I told you they're relentless. Thirty seconds on the rebuttal. Just a reminder. Okay, as a city councillor, how would you go about creating more affordable housing options in POCO? Should I go first? Please. We know that in British Columbia, citizens are paying roughly 60 or even more percent of their disposable income for housing. Actually, it could be more now because interest rates went up and for everybody with uh, line of credit or variable rates, they are paying much more. Uh, so, how to do it? <laughs> um, one of the ways to do it is to control population. That means also being in communication with all levels of the government, with the provincial and the federal government. 
we do have lots of newcomers and if I remembered it right for this year the federal government plans to import roughly 430,000 people newcomers that will come to our country roughly right uh, so and they don't all have to come to the big cities to Vancouver and lower mainland or Toronto we could disperse them after and have them sent somewhere else right so that would reduce the pressure here thanks Ivanka Dean thank you well, affordable housing is something that we work hard on as a, as a team at City Council. Uh, to be straight up, I mean, the, the easy answer would be let Councillor Pollock lead the charge because he does such a fantastic job in being heading up that portfolio. Um, something you may not know is in our city, uh, Mayor West has designated councillors to each different sort of their specialties um, and their passions, which Councillor Pollock has delivered a lot on. Um, but we have to continue to have relationships with BC Housing, Metro Vancouver Housing, and developers to provide opportunities within our rezonings to um, provide more affordable housing. As we know, it's a challenge. I have 30-year-old kids, and it's a challenge for everyone, but uh, I think we're on a good path to work with those agencies, as I mentioned, to... Um, provide more housing in our area. So it's called a smattering of applause. Am I okay to comment? Yeah. Uh, so Burr Coquitlam is very specific. We have very limited space. It's not like Coquitlam or Surrey or Maple Ridge, that there's lots of land. So we are limited by our rivers. Um, certainly rezoning and we do have lots, there are big lots that could be rezoned and so build a fourplex instead of one big house and we are doing that, right? So um, that's one of the way. Um, also, a city could build um, an apartment building and be the owner and have really affordable rents. Thanks, Ivanka. Dean? I'm not in favor of that. That's not the business we're in. I think we need to put more pressure on the feds and the provincial government to provide more housing. That's the business they're in. Justin mentioned earlier that we, we get 12% of your total tax bill, but the other stat that he didn't mention was we deliver 80% of the daily services that you, that you enjoy, water, sewer, and the like, and the like. So, we need to keep putting the, the heat on the, the provincial and the federal government to help out with that. Thank you. Thank you, Tim. Okay, next up we have Paige, Derek, and Eric. Okay, what actions will you take to ensure government transparency? I think this question goes back to one of the earlier questions about engaging the public and engaging citizens at every level of decision making. Um, I think also, as leaders in our community, we don't always know what people don't know. So having that open communication and being able to understand where where is the information not being received where do we need to do better at communicating to the public so i think that's something that goes back to the engagement process like we've been saying um i'm gonna leave it at that again because i know i'm gonna run out of time <laughs> Not on. Ah, oh, there we go. <laughs> yeah, so this is, uh, uh, comes again, comes back to the earlier question we talked about transparency and how transparency is essential for building public trust. Um, so I talked about, uh, we talked about sort of uh, community, uh, community um, open houses, and I think, you know, that, that's, that's one thing we can do. Um, but if you look at the city website, and if you really, like, there's some superficial information there on the city website, but if you really want to dig down, there's a list of capital projects coming up. This is just one example. There's a list of capital projects coming up. And 
there, there's, there's the list there and it tells you what they are, but if you want to go in detail and get information about them and what, what's the budget, what's the cost and that sort of thing, it would be very hard to find that information. And you can make phone calls and inquiries to staff and you don't always get response and maybe this is some of the things where we could uh, shore up some of those services. And it's not a criticism of staff, it's, it's probably just they've got so many things to do uh, and, and in, in responding to all those public inquiries. If, if there's a delay in that response time, I'm sure we can make. I'm sure we can find ways to make those uh, services more efficient. This is one of the things I've done. Thanks, Eric. Yeah, I also think it goes back to an earlier question about uh, donations from business as well as unions, actually, because that's uh, somewhat of a conflict of interest, but also uh, developers should be able to cut the red tape as much as possible. So we should be talking to developers, which goes back to the housing issue, about what is the problem with the red tape and how could we get affordable housing built faster? So these are sort of all connected, but it seems like a real conflict of interest if you maybe are receiving donations from unions and you also have to negotiate with them. So that's a, a big transparency issue. I know it's on the citizens to look into this, so there is a provincial law that says you have to disclose, but it's after the election. I think it's probably on us to find out what it is, but it would be beneficial to find out these disclosures before the election. Is it, is it open? Thank you, Paige. Um, Thank I'll you. just add to what I was saying. Um, I think it's important to note that city council meetings are open to the public, but we all have busy lives. We don't always have time to go down to city hall and sit in and listen to sometimes painstaking city council meetings. Sorry, Mayor West. Um, <laughs> but so I think it's also important to be a little bit more progressive and to meet people where they're at, get people the information that they need where they're already consuming information. So whether that's social media, whether it's email newsletters, Thank you, Eric. Thank you for saying meeting people where they're at. This is what I was trying to articulate earlier. But so going over to your point, and I like what you said, and and the the, the bit about transparency and the bit about uh, uh, disclosure, and I think that there's an opportunity for a, for a UBCM uh, motion to not only disclose who your co campaign contributors are, but what affiliations they have, and I think that's really important that we. I mean, that, there's an opportunity for us to uh, to bring that to uh, UBCM, bring that to the provincial government. And also, I think I'd like to be the Harry Rankin of City Council where you actually get out and meet the people. So I would say we should have roving council meetings or even uh, roving development meetings. So you can actually, because going to City Council is very intimidating. It's like a court uh, criminal situation. Nobody goes, to, nobody goes to City Council because they're intimidated. But if we met you eye to eye on the street, you would probably talk to us. Okay, Thank you. excellent. Thank you. Okay, last group. Uh, may I call up Sarah, Darren, and Glenn. How are you planning to engage with the neighboring community of Coquitlam to mitigate the effects of Burnt Mountain development, specifically increasing traffic in Poco's north side and the displacement of wildlife in our neighborhoods? All right, Sarah. Great question. Planning to educate myself and both cities on everything that is going on and all of the options, doing all of the research, learning, and listening to everybody's opinions, ideas on what we can do to move forward to make sure that it's a good transition. Excellent. Darren? The Fremont Connector, of course, is hopefully going to help with the, the traffic into Port Coquitlam's north side and the displacement of wildlife into our neighborhood. I don't want to be guessing on that one. 
Glenn's got an answer on this one. Uh, he told me he did. I wasn't on that part. But oh, yeah. okay. Anyway. Okay. No, Glenn, okay. go ahead. We have never had more engagement with Coquitlam than we do right now. We have a joint policing committee and we have a joint traffic committee and, and a joint, and, but I can't, I can tell you honestly, they're really difficult to deal with. They think of us as the little brother next door and they just pat us on the head and ignore our concerns to a large degree. We're working on the Fremont connector. That's going to be a great improvement. It's going to move the, the traffic east of Cedar, which has been a, a big, you know, a big thing in Poco, a, a terrible obstacle. But honestly, I don't think Coquitlam is going to be satisfied until they've gone up over the top of that mountain or, and are into the wilderness somewhere, they, their development. And we, every time we meet with them, we, we talk to them about slowing down. And, and it just falls on deaf ears. I, I've met with people who live on St. Anne. And there was houses being built behind their backyard. And I've gone to Coquitlam City Councilors and begged them to come out and talk to those people. But they're not Coquitlam residents. They're Poco residents, so they wouldn't have anything to do with them. So I'm going to stop talking now before I get myself in trouble. <laughs> Thank you for throwing Coquitlam under the bus. Well, you know what? You know what? Coquitlam Is residents. it my turn to go back again? Yeah. Okay, so, so traffic on Coast Meridian 2 is just... Terrible. And, and like, I went to a lady's house a couple of years ago and stood in her living room and she said, watch when the dump truck comes down Coast Meridian, watch my mantle and everything on her mantle shook. And I went to a few Coquitlam counselors who I won't name here, but they said, oh, it's just the price of development. You know, all those trucks coming down, they're just the price of development. And it's just, it's frustrating to have a neighboring community that surrounds us. Whoever designed the, uh, it was Reeves, city counselors of the days, designed those borders, it was nuts. Glenn Pollack rebutting his self. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Thank you. Sarah? Thank you, Glenn. Um, yes, I think that this is a major issue with whether it's the mantles of people's houses or the wildlife that is being displaced, and we have to figure out a plan. And working together, we have to have a great relationship with Coquitlam and all of our neighboring cities. And I hope to start that relationship or continue that relationship and make things smoother yeah thanks sarah darren did you have anything to add all i can say is because i don't have the answer but i'm prepared to listen to those who do <laughs> no i'm serious because you may have the answer to that right now or whoever asked that question may have a good solution to it and that's the job of a council is to listen to you and come up with the solution and let's move on so on and because i know with the traffic as glenn was talking about burke mountain we have all the rat racers going through my neighborhood at Birchland Manor, causing problems with our local streets. And that's a major problem on the north side, but that's a major problem in Poco anyway. So. Excellent. Thanks, all. Okay, so that concludes the Q&A portion of the evening. The candidates uh, will be given 60 seconds closing statement. Um, please stand while you are speaking and then pass the microphone along. And Jenny, we're going to start with you. Um, so I'd like to close today uh, with our the democratic system is fragile and we need to start protecting it from the local level before it's gone too far gone for us to save it. And we need leaders with strong moral courage to stand up for what is right and not just for what is popular opinion right now. Popular opinion can be easily manipulated by the co corporate media who don't represent the true voice of the average hardworking Canadians. So if you want your voice heard, vote for me on October 15th. Growing up with Terry Fox as our hometown hero meant everything to me. His disability and determination to overcome it was celebrated and honored. He, as a little girl with broken ears, he gave me the courage and the ability to dream big, see that creating change was possible in this world. Elect me as your city council, and together we can continue to dream and implement great things. I want to thank the Tri-City Ch Chamber of Commerce for having us here, and I want to give a big shout out to the folks up at Minicata fighting the forest fires for us today. <laughs> My seven-year-old grandson, Lewis, recently asked me what was my favorite thing about being a city councillor. My reply was to help shape 
where and what the city will be and look like in the decades to come. I'd like to take this opportunity to thank everyone that put their name forward. It's a lot of courage, it takes a lot of courage and sacrifice to do so. For those who are, are uh, successful, you'll find that there's few greater rewards than being a part of what shapes the future of the place you call home. Thank you and good luck on October 15th. I want to thank the Tri-Cities Chamber of Commerce for organizing this meeting, Riverside Community uh, Church for hosting us, and the audience here at ho and at home watching. By watching this debate, you're engaging in our political system in a real and important way. Sorry for sounding like a political scientist. Through increased engagement, we can better tackle the issues we face as a community. At the start of this meeting, I shared with you the realities of my living situation, one that I'm sure many people can relate to. Despite affordability being large, uh, a large and daunting problem, I want to end tonight with optimism. I'm optimistic that the city of Port Coquitlam will elect a council committed to working with Mayor West to tangibly tackle affordability. I believe we can come together and use expertise within our community to find creative and needed solutions. I believe with that we can preserve the Port Coquitlam that we love and prepare a Port Coquitlam that will be proud to pass down to future generations. You can, you can read more about my uh, campaign on justinalexandersmith.ca. And that's it. Thank you. I've had a ton of jobs in my life. I delivered eggs in Regina when I was a little kid. I delivered the Winnipeg Free Press newspaper. I, I'm going to really date myself here. I'll tell you, I set pins as a kid at Community Bowl in Trail, BC, <laughs> before mechanized pin boot setters. But, and I, I've, worked, I've worked at Safeway for 32 years. I have recent, most recently worked for Mike Farnworth, the RMLA, as a constituency assistant. And uh, during those jobs, I worked driving truck and as a landscaper, many jobs to pay for my kids' education and their sports. But I've never had a job I was so passionate about and I love so much as being a city councillor. So I'm hoping you'll honour me with letting me, voting for me and having me serve another term, uh, serving the residents of Port Coquillon. Thank you. We've discussed a lot of significant issues here tonight. And I think it's important to recognize that as long as we have a city to run, there will be issues. Um, and as long as our city is full of lots of beautiful and diverse people, uh, we're going to disagree on some of those issues. But what matters is that we're committed to having these open conversations to consider things from different viewpoints, to ask questions and to learn from each other. I don't want this job to be a politician. I want this job to make a difference. I see people in my community, I see their challenges, I see what really matters to them, and I really care. My guarantee is that I'll always lead with integrity. With your support, I'll bring energy and passion and a new perspective to City Council. So visit my website to learn more about my background and experience, grab my pamphlet on the way out. Um, and October 15th, I hope you'll vote for me. My name is Paige Petru. Thank you. Well, if you like living in a city that's really well managed financially, if you like projects that get done on time and on budget during COVID, gonna replay, gonna repeat that again, because that's a pretty big deal. Um, then please vote for me and vote for, for our team. Uh, I think we've uh, done very well over the last number of years. Uh, we've also delivered a lot of uh, non-market housing that didn't cost you as taxpayers any money. That's a real, that's a real key thing there. So I'm planning to continue on if you would uh, be so kind as to reelect me. Um, myself, I really enjoy being on council and uh, working with the people that I have been working with. We've got some of our great staff here. Part of that makes the city up is really good staff and they also deserve a really big hand of applause because this is part of our community. So please on the 15th or whenever you get out to vote, please uh, vote for myself and check out my webpage. Thank you, uh, Tri-Cities. So, uh, in the last election, we were asked at the end of the meeting, after four years on council, what would you deem to be success? I said Port Coquitlam would be the safest city in British Columbia. We've started that, or this council has started that with the flashing beacons, the humps, but there's still work to be done. When I'm knocking on the door this election, I'm still hearing it from the residents. Number one issue, 
Community safety. It's the streets. It's the, our neighborhood local streets that people are afraid to be using. The kids can't play, ride their bikes. People are walking their dog without cars racing down the street. This is, uh, we now have six highways in Port Coquitlam. Eastern Highway, Western Highway, Pitt River Highway, Cedar Highway, Coast Meridian Highway. And pr well, Prairie, we're taken care of, aren't we? So, but there's a lot of traffic calming, and that's what I have found knocking on the doors, uh, is the neighborhood calming is what people want. So that would be the... Vote for me. <laughs> Serving on a municipal council is a civic duty and responsibility. There's a lot of changes coming to our community with interconnected concerns. To ensure that we don't leave people behind will require having broad experience, wisdom, and critical problem-solving skills at the council table. And that brings me back to a lesson I learned from a program manager. This guy I worked with at Nokia, who was this classically stoic Finn, and he said, program management is not about budgets and schedules and having the best ideas or the right team structures. Of course, you need to do all of those things, but success or failure is about people. Build strong relationships with people and you will ultimately never fail. Of course, he's not just talking about program management, he was talking about life. And I've carried that lesson with me, that, that wisdom with me. And as you've seen here this evening, we won't always agree. But if we can start every conversation with mutual respect and compassion for our neighbors. I want to thank the Tri-City Chamber of Commerce for hosting this very important event, for my husband Ray for accompanying me here tonight and for my kids watching online. It's been heartwarming meeting and reacquainting with so many people on the doorsteps again. Thank you for sharing your time and your thoughts with me. You continue to be the wind beneath my sails. It would be an honour and a privilege to have your vote so that I can continue working hard to bring forth positive ideas that will make Port Coquitlam an even better place. Thank you to each and every one of you for coming out tonight. Nancy McCurra. Fifteen years of experience in the entertainment world and cutting my tooth in the world's biggest film industry has given me two unique superpowers iron skin, and titanium spine. From being in a leadership position behind the scenes as an industry liaison in Disney, to a career in education here in Canada. These environments have fast-tracked my development through the perspective I have gained. Your environment and circumstances make you. Mine have made me a natural problem solver, an involved listener, an experienced champion of all voices, and most of all, resilient. The biggest barrier to urban resilience is lack of representation. I am very thankful to the Tri-Cities Chamber of Commerce and to all of you who are here today because you've given me the privilege of engaging with you. I've heard from POCO residents, they want more representation and less tokenism, more diversity on city council. And speaking of Burke Mountain, I have a proposal that uh, we merge Burke Mountain with Port Coquitlam. I would approach the province to do that. I don't know if any incumbents would, they would lose their job, but there's mega cities in Toronto and uh, Ottawa. It would have to be province top down, done. That way we would get the tax dollars instead of just the damage from that area. Um, I also have a proposal for a precinct on my substack, Derek Jeffrey, Dot .substack .com. Democracy doesn't mean consensus. In fact, it's quite the opposite. Democracy should involve the vigorous thrust and parry of debate. Good discussions come out of this forge. If you vote for me, you have nothing to lose, as I may not be a consensus candidate, but I am a critical thinker who wants to hear what you think, and you will have a strong voice on council if they should decide your rights are viable in the future. Thank you. I'm here, I'm here. 
because I want to learn. I want to listen, and I want to ensure that the future for me, my kids, and all the residents of Port Coquitlam now and in the future is great. We live in a great city. I love living here. I love raising my kids here. We specifically chose Port Coquitlam. I have been and I will continue to be a strong leader in our community. I've been made fun of because I actually like door knocking, but I love meeting new people. That's part of my job. That's why I think I'm great at my job. I love talking to people. I love listening and hearing all of your opinions and what you think matters is important to me. And that's why I want to be part of Port Coquitlam's City Council. So Sarah Harbord, October 15th. Thank you. Uh, thanks very much. Uh, thanks also, Jen, for doing a great job as a moderator. It was really well done. Thank you very much for that. Um, uh, I was originally going to have my daughter come up and uh, tell you to vote for me on October 15th, but we all know what happened there, so that's not going to happen. Uh, I do want to leave. Um, I, I love this job. I, I love the work that we're doing, but I want to leave you with an email that I got this afternoon that really sums up what I'm about. It was from Charlie, who said, Steve helped me with an issue in 2022 with me simply cold calling him. I'll never forget his help and I'll support good people like Steve. So on the 15th, be like Charlie and support good people. Thank you. I didn't have a chance to uh, comment on climate um, action plan. We actually have one and lots of it is really good. Uh, now, there's something I don't agree in that plan, and that is it says a CO2, um, zero CO2 community. Uh, and I also would like to give an example how important it is to have um, proper communication and freedom of information. So we are following this mantra, climate change mantra agenda, but at the same time, we did not invite to uh, the table scientists like Dr. Patrick Moore. So what I would like to do is uh, invite other uh, scientists, doctors, and have an open forum, open discussion, not just about climate change, but also about other issues. Now, if uh, Dr. Moore said that right now we have the lowest level of CO2 in Earth's history, right? So uh, if we would listen to scientists First of all, thank you, Chamber of Commerce, for having us here tonight. Every day of this campaign, I have knocked on doors. Talking with the residents of Port Coquitlam has been the most enjoyable part of this election for me. And what I hear the most, people love this city. They love Port Coquitlam. But they do recognize it's a work in progress, and we can continue to make it better. Although all these issues that we've talked to, about tonight are important, I am not running to be able to execute my own personal views, but rather be a voice and advocate for what the people of Port Coquitlam need and what they want. I will do what is best for the city and for the people who live here. I love Port Coquitlam and I will work very, very hard. Once again, I'm Cindy Kartner and I hope you'll vote for me on October 15th. Thank you, good night. Leading and serving on a number of diverse boards has prepared me well for a council role. I will serve with integrity, focus, and strong leadership. I bring a balanced approach to issues and informed decision making. As councillor, I would be representative of the overall best interests of the community to ensure the views, concerns, and interests of all groups are given due consideration. You can help bring a knowledgeable, experienced, and capable new voice to council. You have the opportunity to position Port Coquitlam for the future. It is time for change. Time for a fresh perspective on community issues. Time for a new voice on City Council. I am Don Becker, a proven community leader. Go to donbecker.ca. Thank you for your support. Okay, thanks everyone. Uh, I 
I'd like to thank the candidates uh, for tonight and coming out. Uh, it's, it takes a lot of bravery to be up here um, and for standing for public office. So thank you. Uh, to the 95 people that did not want to put on pants tonight, we'd like to thank you for watching from Zoom. Uh, and I'd also like to point out that I am finishing on time and on budget. Okay, this concludes our meeting. Thank you to everyone for joining us tonight. The video recording will be available on the Chamber website shortly at tricitychamber.com. Thank you again to the Chamber Group Insurance Plan for sponsoring tonight's event and to our venue, Riverside Community Church. Please vote on October 15th. <laughs>